This presentation will be covering embankment seismic performance, um, chapter D8 of best practices. Um, for this brief session, we will cover some of the general aspects for evaluating the performance of embankments during earthquakes. Um, but just keep in mind that this is a very broad presentation, and in reality, um, this subject could be expanded um, to a short course conducted over several days. So there are many factors that come into play um, for how dams perform during earthquakes, which include the geologic depositional environment, um, the embankment strength and configuration, the foundation strength, the types of materials present in both the foundation and the embankment, um, the proximity to faults or subduction zones, and the duration of the earthquake, as well as the strength of motion. So the objective of this presentation is to develop a general understanding for evaluating the performance of embankments during earthquakes and to recognize the potential failure modes for embankments associated with earthquakes. Um, so the key concepts to take away from this presentation include um, the strength of the seismic load imposed and the amount of freeboard that's available. So for example, it would be hard to justify elevated risks for embankments that are dry or nearly dry most times of the year. And then also understanding liquefaction and what level of ground motion triggers liquefaction. Um, we also need to be able to estimate the magnitude of deformation that could cause overtopping. And if an embankment deforms but does not overtop, um, do we have seismic induced cracks that could lead to an internal erosion failure? So we will cover some important case histories where dams and levees were impacted by earthquakes. Um, we will go over the typical steps for evaluating seismic risks to embankments. We'll review some of the most common failure modes associated with earthquakes. Um, we'll discuss loading considerations, both from the reservoir and an earthquake. Um, we'll review liquefaction and strength loss concepts. And we'll identify tools used to estimate embankment deformation, as well as tools used to estimate seismic induced cracking. So some important case histories. Um, so shown here are some of the more important case histories for failure due to an earthquake. Um, so on the left, Sheffield Dam failed completely in 1925 due to foundation liquefaction. In the middle, um, Lower San Fernando was very close to failing due to embankment liquefaction caused by a magnitude 6.9 earthquake in 1971, um, and it only had about five feet of freeboard remaining. And then on the left, um, Fujinuma Dam failed in 2011 due to foundation liquefaction caused by the Tohoku uh, magnitude 9.0 earthquake with the ground accelerations around 0.3 G. And there were also several levees in Japan that either failed or were severely, severely damaged. Um, the USSD performance of dams during earthquakes, volumes one through three, is also a good resource for additional information on their performance of embankments during earthquakes. And um, a key takeaway from our case histories is that only about 1.5% of historical failures of embankment dams have been attributed to earthquakes. So there's definitely a frequency component that plays a critical role. Okay, so steps for risk assessment. Um, first, we have to gain an understanding of the site conditions by using several techniques, including SPTs, cone penetration, um, geophysical testing, undisturbed lab testing, and most importantly, talking to your geologist. The, the geologist is going to play a, a key role in this analysis. Then we have to develop site-specific failure modes. For example, if deformation is unlikely, maybe only cracking needs to be evaluated. Um, so then we develop event trees for the different failure modes. And in some cases, the failure modes can be evaluated in one event tree. Next, we develop or obtain site-specific loading conditions. Um, if if the reservoir is empty or has a large amount of freeboard, maybe the failure mode is not a significant risk contributor and can be screened out right away. Um, once it's determined that seismic failure modes are significant risk contributors, 
uh, more rigorous analysis should be completed, including liquefaction, deformation analysis, um, and site-specific seismic loads, to, to name a few. Um, so last, um, we update the consequences because they can be different from the, our static failure modes. For example, overtopping due to an earthquake could be a very rapid failure with very little warning time available, unlike a flood overtopping event where warning top time can be given well in advance. So next we'll review some of the common failure modes related to earthquake loading. Um, liquefaction is the main mechanism that can cause flow slides and lead to overtopping failures or cracking induced internal erosion failures. Um, basically, the earthquake ground motion can cause pore pressures to develop, which reduces the effective stress in the soil, um, causing a loss in strength. Um, liquefaction is most common in loose, clean sand, but can occur in finer grain silts and medium dense sands if the ground shaking is severe enough. Um, liquefiable soils are common to alluvial valleys and hydraulically placed soils. And um, a lot of our dams and levees are founded on alluvial soils. <clears throat> so strength loss in fine grained soils is another mechanism that can cause severe deformation and cracking in embankments. Um, soft, normally consolidated clays with high moisture contents can be susceptible to strength loss. Um, these soils are common to lacustrine, glacial, glacial lacustrine, and marine environments. Um, and typically, normally consolidated soils have low shear strengths and can lose strength due to earthquake-induced strains, um, commonly between 1 and 5 percent. So here we have some typical failure modes associated with deformation and transverse cracking. So the figure in the upper right is commonly referred to a flow slat, um, where the deformation exceeds freeboard and leads to an overtopping failure, or if freeboard remains, it could lead to a crack-induced internal erosion failure. Um, the figures in the middle um, reflect cracking-related failure where either the soft foundation compresses and causes cracking in the overlying embankment, or the loose outer shells pull away from the core, causing cracking and shortened seepage paths, and then eventually leading to an internal erosion failure. So at this point, um, we evaluate cracking similar to the concepts discussed in section D6 on internal erosion. Um, another common failure mode is the rupture of a fault beneath an embankment. Um, so these are examples of earthquake earthquake fault rupture propagation through soil. So the figure on the left um, is illustrating the path of a reverse fault rupture or compressive movement through soil. Um, the middle figure shows the path of a, of a normal fault rupture. And the figure on the right shows the path of a strike slip fault rupture. So we may also see cracking due to embedded or adjacent structures. Um, such as at conduit contacts. Um, typically, these are located deep in the embankment and thus cracks may close due to the confining pressure pressures. Um, but we also may see that at spillway wall contacts. Um, separation has been observed in these areas um, in some case histories and typically the orientation is transverse. Um, and we also see it at the concrete embankment wraparound sections. So this is similar behavior to the other structure contacts, um, but this path is typically more um, circuitous. So in addition, cracks can also develop where there are significant changes in slope and the foundation profile. So if the potential failure mode can't be screened out, um, then we perform the following for each selected earthquake and reservoir load combination. So this includes estimating the likelihood of liquefaction or cyclic softening, estimating the residual shear strength of the materials that may liquefy or may experience strength loss, and estimating the deformation of the embankment. Um, if deformation is greater than freeboard, an overtopping failure can occur. If freeboard remains, 
then a crack induced internal erosion failure can occur. And so all of these processes will be touched on in later slides. So then um, we complete the event tree similar to static potential failure modes. Um, so for overtopping erosion, we assess the likelihood of failure for various steps of overtopping as described in chapter D3. And for internal erosion, we assess the potential cracking characteristics and estimate the likelihood of failure due to concentrated leak erosion as a function of the earthquake and coincident water level as described in chapter D8. So here we have a sample of entry for seismic crest deformation. Um, node 1 captures the annual probability of different levels of earthquake loading um, in the form of selected ranges of PGA or other measurements of earthquake shaking, and this will come from the probabilistic seismic hazard analysis curve. Um, node 2 captures different levels of the reservoir that would exist at the time of the earthquake. So this will come from the stage duration um, relationship or curve. And then node three is evaluating widespread liquefaction of foundation or embankment soils and whether or not this occurs. And then nodes four and five, um, which show with and without widespread liquefaction, um, there are two possible outcomes. One being deformation exceeding the available freeboard, making failure of the dam by overtopping flow quite likely, or two, um, deformation less than the freeboard, in which case the dam could fail by internal erosion through cracks or not fail at all. And that's where we would need to expand the event tree for those specific failure modes. Okay, so moving to loading considerations. So this is a common plot of annual exceedance versus peak ground acceleration. Um, the most common approach is to develop load bins where we would see changes in performance. As an example, an earthquake having a return period of 475 years or less may cause little to no damage um, to an embankment, whereas loads greater than 475 year um, earthquake and less than the 2500 year earthquake may cause two to five feet of deformation. And then even further, loads between the 2500 year earthquake and 10,000 year earthquake um, could cause five to 10 feet of deformation. And then anything over the 10,000 year earthquake may cause significant deformation um, greater than 10 feet. For water supply embankments, um, we use the percentage of time exceedance plot to develop partitions or as input into the inventory. Um, for flood control embankments and levees with large fluctuations in reservoir, river, or coastal water levels, um, failure modes are also a function of the coincident water level. So this is again where we would use the stage duration relationship um, for the frequencies and the system response is going to be a function of the PGA um, and the coincident pool. So this matrix, illust matrix illustrates um, the joint loading probability based on the earthquake and coincident pool. Um, the seismic hazard curve for the PGA and the pool duration curve were partitioned as shown here in the table. Um, the product of the partition probabilities is the joint loading and can be used to estimate the APF um, conservative, conservatively assuming the SRP equals one for screening purposes. So a similar matrix can be generated um, for the product of the APF from this figure and incremental life loss for each reservoir partition um, to estimate the annualized life loss for screening purposes also. Um, this matrix also illustrates that the system response probabilities for seismic potential failure modes are a function of both the earthquake and the coincident pool. So in this example, um, we assume an evaluation was performed that indicates the structure will perform extremely well for PGA values less than 0.2 G and reservoir loadings less than um, elevation 216.5. So you can see um, the cells from the previous worksheet corresponding to PGA values less than 0.2 G and coincident pull elevations less than elevation 216.5 were deleted from the matrix since they are negligible contributors 
to the total risk. So next are some methods for estimating liquefaction potential. So estimating the likelihood of liquefaction for any given zone or layer depends on several factors and requires computations outside of the event tree. So keep in mind, it's not the intent of the best practices manual to provide a detailed discussion of liquefaction evaluation. Um, Reclamation and USACE both have separate seismic design guidance um, and state of practice for liquefaction triggering evaluation is contained in these references shown here by Idris and Boulanger, which provide probabilistic liquefaction triggering correlation for SPT and CPT values. So shown here are the formulas for calculating the cyclic stress ratio and the probability um, of liquefaction. The CSR equation is the stress imposed by an earthquake normalized by the effective overburden pressure. Um, so this is what is considered the seed simplified method because it's primarily a function of the peak ground acceleration. Um, this cyclic stress can also be calculated using more rigorous one or two dimensional computer programs using site specific time histories. Um, the probability of liquefaction is a function of both the CSR and the blow counts corrected for overburden stress and funds contents. So the probability of cyclic softening can be calculated by comparing the CSR which is based on differing earthquake return periods to the cyclic resistance ratio or CRR of the clay. If the CRR is less than the CSR, there's a high potential for strength loss. The CRR of the clay is a function of the stress history and the overconsolidation ratio. What we see in a lot of our large dams is the foundation is normally consol consolidated or just slightly over consolidated because the embankment imposes a new load and that load exceeds any other loads it has experienced through its geologic history. Um, so S is the strength ratio for normally consolidated clay and is typically around 0.2 to 0.25 and M is a coefficient which is usually around 0.8. So both can be referenced in the LAD and FOOT paper published in the 1970s. So several empirical correlations um, have been published that um, correlate residual undrained shear strength of liquefied material with standard penetration test resistance. Um, the most common relationships used in practice include Seed and Harder and Idris and Boulanger. Um, the primary difference between the two is that the seed and harder relationship provides undrained shear strength as a function of blow count, but the Idris and Boulanger relationship provides the ratio of undrained shear strength to pre-earthquake vertical effective overburden stress. So within the very limited case history database, uh, most instances of flow liquefaction have occurred at very um, fairly shallow depths. Um, in other words, with low effective overburden pressure, and none had an equivalent blow count value above 14. Um, it's likely that the lack of embankment flow liquefaction cases for the medium to high blow count materials is related to the fact that high blow count materials are dilative, and the medium blow count materials, which may be initially contractive, become dilative with strain. So moving on to embankment deformation. Um, if liquefaction does not occur, movements that occur within the dam body or foundation can still lead to deformations that exceed the available freeboard. Um, Sways Good examined case histories of seismic induced settlement and mass deformation where the earthquake shaking causes embankments to settle. The incident database does not contain any cases with PGA greater than 0.7 G or normalized settlements greater than 5%. However, some incidents involving liquefaction were included in the database, um, such as Hebgen Dam, um, Upper San Fernando Dam, and um, Massaway Dam. Austrian Dam did not experience liquefaction, 
but had other issues like poor compaction and an existing landslide that was left in place in one of the abutments. Um, so if these cases are excluded, the database does not contain any, grace, any cases with normalized settlements greater than 1%. Newmark and other updates to the Newmark procedures shown here can also be used to estimate deformation of embankments. But these also should only um, be used for embankments and foundations with no liquefaction potential. Um, finite element or finite difference computer models are now commonly used to estimate deformation. Um, several parameters go into these models and are not always super intuitive. Um, these include, but are not limited to, shear modulus, density, shear strength, pore pressure responses, small and large strain, strength degradation, and soil damping characteristics. Um, these parameters can be obtained empirically or from lab testing and field measurements, but a great deal of judgment is required um, for developing these input parameters. For post-earthquake deformation, the computer program FLAC or PLAXIS can also be used to analyze seismically induced deformation. Um, FLAC is a two-dimensional explicit finite difference program, and PLAXIS is a finite element program. Um, many actual observations indicate that most of the deformation actually occurs after the shaking stops. Um, this can be a much less complicated and sometimes more reliable analysis when compared to the issues of modeling the deformation during dynamic shaking. Dynamic deformations are typically small with respect to the gravity deformation portion. Um, unless you're modeling a long duration earthquake caused by a subduction zone type earthquake, um, which can cause significant deformation during and after the earthquake. Um, in post Post-earthquake deformation is best utilized when the residual strength of the weak layer causes the embankment to have a slope stability factor of safety less than one. So moving to internal erosion through cracks. When looking at seismic induced cracking, we estimate damage class from deaggregation of seismic hazard for each seismic load partition. Um, so we assume a damage class three or four if liquefaction occurs. Um, and we estimate maximum like, likely crest settlement um, with cracking beginning at the settled crest elevation. And then we estimate probability of transverse cracking. Um, and we do this using expert elicitation and um, fell at all as a guide. Um, we then estimate the maximum likely crack width at the crest using fell at all, um, and we estimate the maximum likely crack depth. Um, and then we estimate the probability of initiation, continuation, and progression of concentrated leak erosion for the various reservoir partitions. Um, and this is detailed further in chapter D6 um, on internal erosion. So shown here are the charts and tables for estimating damage class and the probability of transverse cracking. And there's also a table that isn't shown here that can be used to estimate the depth of cracking based on the width of cracking at the crest. So to recap some key issues to consider, um, what are the, the defensive measures of the dam? Um, are there filters to prevent or control internal erosion of the dam and its foundation? Um, are there zones of good drainage capacity? In other words, free draining rock fill. Um, what's the embankment stability during and immediately after the earthquake? Um, what are the earthquake induced deformations and dam freeboard? Um, what is the liquefaction potential of saturated sandy and silty soils? and um, some gravels with a sand and silt matrix in the foundation and possibly in the embankment? And do we have cyclic softening potential of soft or sensitive clays in the foundation and possibly in the embankment?